A content warning. This video will be discussing sensitive topics such as sexism, racism, various forms of abuse, homophobia, and suicide. Sometimes you watch a show so trashy that you just... I just... I... I just can't help myself. Ratchet is the latest offering from Netflix in collaboration with executive producer Ryan Murphy, known for executive producing shows like Glee or American Horror Story, among other assorted shows. It supposedly tells the origin story of the renowned villain Nurse Ratchet from the novel turned film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which is a story about structural issues in the United States and how we also culturally treat and abuse the mentally ill, a message that is still incredibly relevant today. Nurse Ratchet is the symbol of authority in this. She is the head nurse of this mental institution where a new patient, McMurphy, is a convict pleading insanity in hopes to avoid working in a prison labor camp. He challenges authority and repeatedly undermines Nurse Ratchet. And, well, you're gonna have to either read the novel or watch the movie to find out the rest of it. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is a fantastic movie and should be experienced on its own. But really, I don't need to talk a whole lot about this film or this novel. Just that this this is the origin point of Mildred Ratchet, our titular character. There is a great discussion to be had about why this show exists, and that Nurse Ratchet as a character is only hurt by explaining who she is. While that is not my focus here, I do highly recommend a video on that exact topic from Acolytes of Horror. Link in the description below for that. This video though will be focused on what the show is, and how this is just... It's just a flaming pile of garbage. Full spoilers are going to be ahead, this show is just not one I feel is worth the nearly 8 hours it takes to watch all the way through it. Now, if you are into bloody, trashy TV, then this may be something for you, and maybe you should go off and do that before watching this video, but I'm going to press onwards. Alright, where to start? Well, the first episode opens with the grisly killings of four priests by a merciless man named Edmund. Then cuts to Mildred Ratchet in her glorious teal-tinted car. Right away you get the feeling that this character is weird about romantic relationships and can be very blunt. You should bathe more often. Your fingernails are filthy. Episode 1 is dense, with small little story points. Few of them though truly matter at all, so we're gonna skip a lot of this. Mildred wants to work at the mental hospital, she does a good old fashioned blackmailing, then she helps the director of the institution cover up a suicide of a patient that Mildred had manipulated to kill themselves, all while the governor of California is there with the media doing press for his upcoming election. Of course, the governor was much too busy to notice the suicide because he was talking to the press about the priest Mildred had secretly poisoned and then saved in order to impress the governor and make herself indispensable to the institution. Later, the priest killer from before is transferred to the institution to undergo evaluation as he claims to be insane. But then we see Mildred alone walking up to his cell, which for some reason has zero guards around it, but whatever, we'll just ignore that, just to reveal that Edmund was secretly Mildred's long lost brother. Although he also isn't, and it's complicated, and that was episode one. So, uh, you see the problem yet? Well, even if you do, we're still moving forward. This show is cram-filled with so much stuff. But even if you gloss over large sections of the plot, like I already have, there's still so much to explain. This to me feels like it's largely done because they just don't have a lot of real story to go after. Like I said before, Mildred poisons and then cures a priest to make her seem indispensable and really impressive to the hospital. But she also convinces a depressed man to commit suicide in the director's office so that she could assist in covering it up, making her doubly indispensable to the hospital. It's just redundancy, for redundancy's sake, to pad out the runtime of this show because they don't have anything to talk about. Like, later on in the show you have a surviving priest who hardly feels like talking about watching Edmund brutally execute his fellow members of the clergy. Mildred though goes to meet him and convince him to talk, saying that his confession will help out with the trial. When he finally agrees, she drugs and lobotomizes him so that he can't give testimony against Edmund. And after it's finally done, 
it, it's completely irrelevant. Edmund is tried off screen once he gets released from the hospital on his sanity. He's convicted and put on death row to be executed in a month's time. There is zero need for any other testimony or that priest's testimony in the first place. It's never relevant. There are far too many instances to document here of the show restating information it's already given you multiple times, along with long fantasy or dream sequences that do absolutely nothing but fill about 10 minutes of runtime an episode. Now you might be thinking, all of those things I just laid out, those are examples of them building up Mildred's character, right? I thought that too, and that would make a lot of sense. It's way more exaggerated than the original Nurse Ratchet, but that would, in theory, Fit. But that's not right either. Because as the series goes on, Mildred actually goes from sadistic monster to woman in love. She discovers in the show that she's actually a lesbian, and she has a tender, delicate romance with another character. This is hinted at earlier in the season when she assists in saving a lesbian couple, who have been lobotomized but act totally normal and show no signs at any point that they've actually had a lobotomy, which is, which is a really frustrating lack of consistency, especially when you consider what this whole story is based off of. The head doctor was also putting them through intense hydrotherapy where they dunk the patient in boiling hot water and then ice cold water. This makes Mildred very angry because they are mistreating their patients. So she and an orderly are compelled to do the right thing and break them out. Now that's a good moment for a protagonist, showing them standing up to the messed up morals of the 40s. But it's a terrible moment for this protagonist. So do you remember before all this where I told you about how Mildred lobotomized an innocent priest? poisoned another priest so she could cure them to make herself seem impressive, and convinced a depressed man to commit suicide so she could help cover up the death. Remember any of that that I just went over? In the same episode where she tries to help them escape, in the same sequence when she's trying to help these lesbians escape, she's also at the same time trying to boil a man to death because he at one point told her that she was really bad at sex. You have intercourse with her the whale. You mean I fuck you from behind? Yes, that's what I just said. Which is objectively kind of hard to argue against. She, of course, covers up this murder as well. This show is incapable of making a single choice. Is Mildred a sadistic, cold-blooded, 4D chess-minded sociopath willing to take down everyone in her path to reach her goal? Or is she a pure heart being corrupted by the evil things she needs to do to protect the people that she loves? The show has absolutely no idea, so neither do I. It changes all the time, and it doesn't change from episode to episode, it changes from scene to scene, even in the same episode sometimes. It just depends on what the writers need at that moment. There is an episode that delves into Mildred's past as an orphan who was sent from foster home to foster home, meeting Edmund along the way and convincing a social worker to fudge some paperwork up and make them siblings so they wouldn't get separated. Then they go to a rich family's home and are horribly abused and forced to do things to each other for an audience of wealthy social elites. The story is horrifying and told mainly through a puppet show of Hansel and Gretel that Mildred is hallucinating to be her childhood. It's not the most original idea, but it does work as a storytelling device. This is then completely undercut when Gwen, Mildred's love interest, takes her to a restaurant afterwards and she just explains her entire backstory directly to the camera in a close-up shot. Nothing was ambiguous about that puppet show explanation. Absolutely nothing. If anything, it was too obvious. But to then go back and explain it again immediately after they just explained it just shows how little they think about their audience or how much they desperately just needed to pad out this show. This scene of her re-explaining a thing that we already know takes five minutes, but it feels like an eternity. It's a show that attempts to shine a light on the misogynistic and racist practices that existed in 1940s America to mixed results. Like how I mentioned earlier, there was hydrotherapy used on a lesbian character as a kind of gay conversion therapy. Or how it shows lobotomies, which were a horrific practice used mainly against women who are either showing manic behavior 
or just talk back to their husbands and or fathers too much. Of course, since our main character is gay, that also becomes a topic of discussion as well, along with the terrible story of racist abuse done to a black female character who then develops multiple personalities to cope with the trauma. And I do feel that it is necessary to include this history in any media that covers this era. But it's a double-edged sword, because if you're gonna do that, you have to get your history spot on, which this show completely fails at. Take Gwen, for example. She is the press secretary to the governor of California. She is within his inner circle. She gives him direct advice on things that he should do for his campaign. And is also a closeted lesbian in a sham marriage with a homosexual black man, using each other as a kind of cover so that they can advance in society. Now, now that basic idea of a homosexual man and woman getting married to seem culturally acceptable to the community, that stuff absolutely happened all the time in this era, there's no doubt about that. The problem is that anti-miscegenation laws still existed in California until 1948. This show takes place in 1947, so it is literally impossible for an interracial marriage to exist in this era of California, much less be accepted by high members of society. That may seem nitpicky, I mean it's just off by a few years, what's really the big deal? But even after it was legalized, interracial couples were not socially acceptable. They absolutely would not propel both members of the relationship to move up the ladder of society as this show explicitly states this marriage does for both parties. Take this, for example, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the book this is all based on came out in 1962. Anti-miscegenation laws weren't deemed unconstitutional until 1967, five years after the book was published. This show tries to have it both ways, but ignoring the ugly realities of American culture is irresponsible when you're a show trying to talk about the ugly realities of American culture. Pick a side and commit. Is this show going to take on serious social issues and show how in America's golden age, there were still very fierce, very violent inequalities that exist in society? Or are you going to be a campy, violent drama that takes place in a world similar to, but not exactly our own? Because the former is just another season of American Horror Story with a different name, and the latter would be a worthy prequel to a book all about how we live in a society that is designed to crush out anyone who is considered to be different. Now, this has all been really negative so far, but there are aspects of the show that do deserve to be commended. First off, even though the writing is atrocious, the acting really helps mask that as best as it can. There were some ridiculous and campy performances like Sharon Stone as a monkey-wielding rich heiress with a monstrous child. There's Cynthia Nixon who plays Gwen and she just excels at this role, while Sarah Paulson does her absolute best as Nurse Ratchet. The writing though just seems to fail her over and over again. Again, not having a consistent narrative structure or consistent real character, it doesn't help someone's acting. The costumes though are just gorgeous, with a fantastic use of color across the board that really captures this kind of ridiculous 40s fashion. Color is all over the place and just incredible, with so much teal and just ridiculous oranges and yellows and reds. Plus, there are some amazing locations for both the hospital and just the scenic California coastline. The score is definitely something I need to point out. It has a very specific Hitchcock-esque suspenseful tone that it's trying to portray. And while the music itself I think is really good, it just again leads to a more confused show. I've hardly mentioned all the Hitchcock-like moments in this show, but it's it's a really clear point of inspiration, and it really just doesn't fit at all with what I feel like this show is trying to be at some times. Again, coming into the clash of what does the show want to be. Okay, well, that's the end of me being nice. Time to talk about the body horror. Just a fun little side story I have here for you. So Sharon Stone's character, Lenora Osgood, has a son, Henry, who has a thing about pricking people and abusing people. Before the events of the show, she hires the director of the mental hospital to treat her son, but he accidentally gets high in LSD with Henry, as one does. Henry then murders the gardener off screen and removes his arms, with the intention of having the doctor sew those arms on to replace his arms. I'm gonna spare you the gore, but he then successfully removes his own arms. It's as fun as you think it'd be. The doctor, still high on LSD, then replaces them just to stop the bleeding, knowing that this is not going to work. He then sobers up and gets the hell out of there. The arms cause an infection and need to be removed, and because of the spreading infection, also his legs. 
which is why Lenore tries to avenge her son by putting a bounty on the doctor's head, wanting him to be killed. Eventually her wish is fulfilled and she presents the decapitated head of the doctor to Henry, who is unsatisfied and has his mother murdered. So what was the point of this little side story? Well, well, in the end, half of Lenore's fortune goes to an endowment for the arts. The rest... will go to my monkey, Petunia, and her continued care. What? My son, Henry, will be transferred to the care of a psychiatric institution where he will spend the rest of his life. I hereby revoke any and all prior wills and codicils I have made. Signed, L.H. Osgood. That's that's the best scene in the entire show. It's really it's it's the best scene in the entire show, without question. Now, if I want to be petty, I could point out how there's huge glaring holes, like how Edmund has been completely cleared of being insane or mentally ill in any way. He's deemed fit to stand trial, stands trial, and is then, you know, found guilty and put on death row. But he still stays in the mental hospital. A mental hospital that he's already escaped from earlier in the show. Not transferred to a max security prison like San Quentin, like a typical prisoner would be in the state of California. Or how Mildred has a whole plan to kill Edmund peacefully, as the governor on the other hand wants to fry him in the electric chair. California has never used the electric chair as an official means of execution in the state's history. It went straight from hangings, to the gas chamber, to lethal injection. This is very easy information to search up. It took me two minutes. Could also point out that of the five black characters in this show, two are gruesomely murdered on screen after being given little dialogue. A third was a guard with two lines of dialogue that watched nurse jerk off Edmund. The fourth was one in the impossible marriage intended to make them more acceptable to society when it would have literally done the opposite because this type of marriage was at the time illegal in the state of California. And the last was a woman with multiple personalities who pulls a split and somehow becomes the Terminator, breaking Edmund out of the minimum security mental hospital for them to go on a killing spree across the country. For those keeping track at home, this is the second time Edmund has broken out of the mental hospital. Why isn't he in a prison? This show made him being in a mental hospital to avoid being in a normal prison a major plot point. This is a topic they brought up. This is also the original premise for the source material about a prisoner trying to feign an illness to go to a mental hospital, which is easier than being in a prison. These are things that are very, very blatant and brought to a lot of attention. So it's hard for me as a viewer to not ask the question, especially when he escapes twice. Okay, back to what I was talking about. Um, I'm pointing out all these things with black characters because representation does matter. It matters a whole lot and you don't see enough of it in Hollywood. It is slightly getting better. It's always been slightly getting better, but it's still really important. It always needs to be something we need to talk about and always bring up. So too does the kind of representation that exists. When I mention that two black characters are gruesomely killed, they are gruesomely killed. And these are outliers most of the deaths in this show were either standard shootings or stabbings or off screen. I've mentioned the show being bloody, but there isn't actually a lot of gruesome deaths that occur on the show for you to see. And other characters that are killed are done so in a very TV standard way. With the possible exception of the man being boiled near to death, but he actually doesn't die from being boiled. He gets shot off screen and just has kind of gross looking skin. None of the other kills in the show come to the same level of violence that is taken to those two black characters that are killed on screen. It is really important to point out when a show messes up on this kind of stuff because I feel like they did have the best kind of intentions. Hiring that many black characters for this era of TV, it's very easy just not to hire anybody. I get it. They did put in an effort. But if you're going to put these kind of things in your show, you have to do more than the bare minimum amount of effort. You have to try to understand the culture that these things took place in and what the reality was for those minorities. Understand the culture you're trying to critique or your critique is going to seem incredibly lazy and you'll have further confused a viewing audience that has such a poor baseline in US history that they may actually believe the representations you're showing here are accurate. They aren't. They just aren't. This show performed a vague idea of wokeness on real controversial topics like 
It was bad to torture gay people. The death penalty sucks. Racism? Well, that's bad. And even on these very basic concepts, they didn't try to make the story feel grounded at all. It twists and turns from one tone to another, characters changing motivation depending on the scene and sudden changes of heart, with very little care and intention brought to the topics they want to address. It refused to be this completely schlocky American horror story, but under a different name, that it clearly wanted to be, and it never put in the appropriate amount of effort to have that hard-hitting social commentary that its source material is famous for. It's a muddled mess that might be worth hate-watching if you're really, really bored, but not much else. Thank you very much for watching this video. It's been a very long time, I feel like, since I've actually been on camera, uh, but it's, it's great to be back, so... Um, I hope you liked this video. If you did, check out my channel. I've got more videos like this that you may enjoy. Like this video if you like it, and leave a comment on what character you think should get their own origin story show. I think we should get one for young Sheldon. Now, I hate The Big Bang Theory. Hardly ever watch it. Not my thing. Just, I don't like the show. And I've never watched Young Sheldon. Never seen a single episode about it. But think about this. You do an origin story to an origin story. Young, young Sheldon. Gold. Now, I would be completely on board for that. You make him a toddler, all he does is like an hour-long show. He just drools at the camera and mumbles bazinga under his breath or something like that. Top of the charts, gonna make all the money. I get executive producer credit, of course. Call me up, we're ready to do it. Young, young Sheldon coming to your TVs and streaming services this fall! Next fall! Production t it takes a long time, guys. Next fall, coming out to you, the people. Okay, this has gone on a bit too long. Thank you very much for watching this video. Subscribe for more, and have a great rest of your day, and stay rad.